day one, session one of uh, PowerShell Summit, Europe edition. And I'm Steve Murawski. Uh, I, I recognize a lot of you, so I've had a chance to meet a lot of you over, over some of my careers. But uh, just a quick little background on me. Uh, currently, I work for Chef. Um, and I say currently because recently, I've, over the past few years, I've changed jobs a lot. Um, hopefully, I will be staying in one place for a little while now. But uh, over the last uh, year, I've been working at Chef. I am on the community engineering team. I'm a software developer. Uh, my background is in Windows operations, uh, systems administration. Prior to Chef, I was at Stack Exchange. So uh, I've been talking about uh, desired state configuration a lot because that's, that's kind of the uh, space I carved out for myself at Stack Exchange. Uh, but I've been in the, uh, in, in the PowerShell and Windows uh, administration space pretty much my whole career in IT. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you need to know or what concepts you need to know to be successful in a DevOps world. Um, how you need to look at transforming your workplace and your, and your team and your operations to deal with the pace of change and with how IT has shifted. Uh, this, is prob this is one of the least technical talks that I, uh, I give. And so there are, we're not going to dive too much into to deep specifics on technology unless you have specific questions on a particular thing. Um, but we're going to cover a, a pretty wide swath of concepts. And so please ask questions and we'll drill down in, into, uh, into what you need to know, what you, you want to know. All right, with that. Having worked in IT operations or systems administration for pretty much my entire IT career, I've always felt kind of like the environments I'm managing are like a game of Jenga. And if you haven't played it before, you have a stack of blocks, somewhat like this, and the idea is that you pull out a block, you move it somewhere, and you tuck it in up at the top. And the idea is, you know, you don't want to be the person that knocks out a block and makes the whole thing topple. And to me, every time I every time I'd go through a patching cycle or I deploy a new application, it was like that game of Jenga. I'm just waiting for the things to fall apart and waiting for waiting for that one thing to happen that was going to knock over my entire infrastructure. And it's not a good feeling. There's, it adds a lot of stress to the environment. It it makes you it makes you kind of it makes you fear change. It makes you uh, it makes it very easy for us to become a culture of no. I want to deploy a new version. No. I want to roll out patches. No. I want to add a new cert, a, a new, new application to the environment. No. Because no no keeps things stable. It lets you stay home at night and have that time with the family or go out for beers with friends or, pl or play a game on Xbox. It's when we had to make those changes in our environment that things got a little sta unstable. And now we're, now we're at work until 12, 1 a.m. Not by choice because we want to work at that time, but because we have to because something's broken. So then you start hearing about companies like Etsy, <coughs> Stack Exchange, Facebook, where they do this thing you know, that's been labeled DevOps. Now, DevOps is a very fuzzy term. There is no specific set of practices that enshrine, that, that make you DevOps or make you do DevOps. But there are, there are some related patterns and practices that kind of embody uh, that embody these concepts. And it feels like, you know, the shops that are doing that kind of thing, they've got it all in the ball, man. They're, they're kicking out new projects uh, out on the GitHub that show how they run operations, and they're doing talks at conferences like Velocity and, and DevOps Days. We're talking about, ah, oh, we deploy software all the time, people don't get paged, you know, things are just awesome, right? And we're, we're moving stuff into the cloud. We're taking advantage of the latest technology. We're doing Docker, you know, whatever. And it feels like maybe you're missing out on some of that, you know, because you know we're still we're, we just got off the of server 2003, or we're still working to get off the of server 2003. And 
PowerShell, man, we, we barely got into PowerShell off of our VB scripts and stuff like that. And, uh, or you know, you're, you're still managing that 20,000 line VB script that helps you get things done. And it's like, I can't change that thing. I can't, I can't go quickly like these organizations. I can't deploy a new operating system tomorrow. I need, I need time for this stuff. Well, what's standing in our way of this? <clears throat> and for the most part, it's us. I, we're the ones that are standing in the way. Or maybe it's our coworkers. And maybe, it, maybe our coworkers are helping hold us back because we want to go and, and put some automation in place. And we want to start using things like source control. And we want, and we want to start um, doing things like the chaos monkey stuff that Netflix does and randomly killing instances in production. Now, if that doesn't send a shiver down your spine, I don't know what will. But it's time for us as IT professionals to really step up our game. And, you know, one of the concepts of being professionals is we have to track what's <coughs> happening in our industry. We have to continually be learning. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard responses from people, well, I know this and that's how I'm going to do it because that's the way we know, that's the way we've been doing it. It's fine. It's not fine. We've got in IT. IT is a is a relatively young, is relatively young as a career path, right? Yes, we've had computers for you know what, 30, 40 years, 50 years, whatever. But what we have, but the patterns of how we do operations have been constantly changing, and we need to be able to change and adapt with that. And so part of that concept of being professionals, we have to be able to break through those walls, knock, those, knock out those things that are slowing us down. This is all about velocity. It's all about speed. It's all about consistency. You know, back when I was at Stack Exchange, one of the things that we did was we said we're going to make sure that at, at just from top down, we were going to care about our environment. And we wanted things to look good. We wanted things to be in order. And so this was the rack when we, this is kind of the state of the racks when we went to our data center at first. And we spent the weekend, and we fixed them up. And we got them, we got them in place. But this, it wasn't, and this is just a physical representation of one of the things that we did. And it was an effort across the board. It was around documentation. It was around our scripts and, and, and our, our automation technologies, trying to bring them all into line so that we were doing things consistently across the board, that we had checklists for things. Those checklists then became workflows. Those workflows then became front-ended by a uh, kind of a self-service portal. It was, all, it was all an effort to clean up, standardize, make things consistent. You know, in this rack, for example, all these top servers were web servers. If one broke down, we could yank it out, <coughs> drop in a new box, plug it all in. And because all of the cables were standardized, it was a matter of, okay, go one, two, three, four, get everything hooked up, drop it back in, drop an OS on it, and you're good to go. And you know whether or not we're talking physical machines, virtual machines, cloud instances, it's all about this kind of taking pride in our operations and making sure that we're doing things in that kind of consistent manner. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to talk about source control, talk about continuous delivery, testing, centralizing our logging and monitoring, and then I've got some other reading links and things that we can, we can talk about as well. So who here uses source control? That's awesome. This, every, every time I give a talk, uh, I ask about source control, the percentage of the room keeps going up. That is a good trend. That is a good thing. Um, for those of you who are not, what's standing in your way? Got a volunteer? <laughs> Colleagues. Hmm? Colleagues. Colleagues? Yeah. All right. That, that's, that brings my second point up. So most, almost everybody in the room here 
So they're using source control. How many are, how many, it's just you, how many of your teams are using source control? That's a much smaller group. So one of the key things to understand about source control, <coughs> number one, it gives you, the, it gives you the, if you're not using it, you need to be using it. But if your team isn't using it, and you can disregard the team thing if you're a sole one-man shop, something like that, but, but in which case you are a team of one and you're using it, that's good. But one of the reasons it's important for, from a team perspective to be using it is source control is a tool for communication. Everybody knows what the current version of things are. Everybody knows what proposed changes are going to happen to something and has a chance to comment on things. Or has a chance, you know, if, for example, uh, if you look at GitHub, you know, GitHub has done a really great thing about taking source control and making it kind of social and giving you the opportunity to comment on blocks of code or on pull requests and, cha and changes and made it very easy to, to have that kind of conversation and, and put that all in one place. Um, if you are not using some kind of source control personally, you need to start. Most of you are doing that. If you're not using it as a team, you need to start getting your teams on board because it helps you only so far. It helps your team so much more. And I'll, I'll dive back into source control in, in just a minute, but the, f the first way of DevOps, and, and we're, so we're gonna talk about source control and a couple other things here as part of this first way. This first way of DevOps is labeled systems syncing. It's all about consistency, about how we do things and building the workflow of how we get something from dev to ops. Now dev, if you might think, oh hey, we don't do any software development in our shop, it's all packaged software, or all, you know, all custom solutions. So that, you know, that doesn't apply to me. False. Um, so Puppet Labs um, does a, a yearly survey, uh, they, they sponsor a yearly survey that's been done in the last few years called the State of DevOps Report. And over the past few years, they published the results. They published the 2015 results not too long ago. One of the things it found is companies that follow these DevOps practices, regardless of where their software comes from, whether it's packaged software, off the shelves, you know, stuff off the shelf, whether it's uh, custom from a third party, you know, what, consultant, whatever. Regardless of where that software came from, the, co the companies that had a solid deployment pipeline to get that into their, their testing or staging or production environments, regardless of where that software came from, they experienced the same return on investment, the same kind of benefits that organizations that have in-house developers do. So this, the DevOps stuff, it's all about operating software, getting that software into production so that business can use it, so that your, your, your business units can use it. So what's really more important is this business and customer versus this dev and ops thing, right? So it's all about how do we get the software the business needs, that stuff that meets a business need, how do we get it in front of the customer, whether it's the public or internal customer? And it's all about consistency and repeatability. We've seen this in manufacturing, right? You, you need a standardized process to get things done. To get things done, and you might not get them done well, but if you're getting them done the same way every single time, now you have a baseline from which you can start determining whether or not changes in your patterns and practices, whether they improve. Um, I would start building a lot of deployment scripts. And one of the things we found out was rather than trying to figure out how to get our machines, like say I was building a web server for all the different Stack Exchange applications, getting a server from state A to state B, say maybe it had stuff on there to, to putting out a new application, was almost was harder 
than dropping down a new operating system and rolling it out all completely from scratch and, and writing the script to roll everything out from the very beginning. And that was because it, it, it's challenging to migrate machines to various states. So we had to come up with a consistent way to do this. And that wasn't the case on our Linux systems where we used a config management tool. So coming back to source control, part of the first step in making things consistent and repeatable is source control. Why? Because it gets everybody centralized on using the same version of things. It's not, oh, hey, uh, yeah, that script's out in the share somewhere. Oh, which version, or what, 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 what file name exactly was that of this script? Or what, what version of that module were you using? If everything's in version control, you have definitive references. Yes? Do you want to talk about the difference between source control and version control? So, yes. Okay, so two terms that are used relatively interchangeably, but there, there are some differences to them. And uh, June, feel free to, uh, to correct me when I, or, where, uh, where I might misstate this. But uh, version control or revision control is tracking changes over time. Source control tends to be tools around source code management. Uh, version, I use them pretty much interchangeably because I, I mean the same thing by them. But you want to having some kind of Version control can be more generic. Version control can also be artifact revisions or artifact versions. So that's things like your NuGet server or, uh, or uh, repositories like Artifactory or uh, something like a, 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 uh, like a Ruby Gems kind of scenario. Um, but source control being the repository for, for the source code. Uh, this is, uh, this is a snippet from the State of DevOps Report 2014. One of the, the one practice that's highly correlated across three major components of IT operations is version control. One of the conclusions that the 2014 State of DevOps Report came to was that it was more important for an IT operations team to use source control than for the developers to do so. It's very important for the developers to do so but it's more important for IT operations personnel. This, this year's, the 2015 report, confirmed those findings, and they actually did some comparisons to, of companies that have high-performing high IT to uh, how their stock prices went for publicly traded companies, and companies that embrace DevOps practices, it was highly correlated to increased stockholder value. Uh, the exact numbers and stuff you can find in the reports. But what that ends up meaning is IT operations is a value add. It's not a cost sink for a business. It's not, it's not just a cost center. And one of, the, one of the key transforming capabilities of going from this cost center to being a, uh, to being a, a win for business and an add to business value is the use of versioning and version control and source control by the IT operations team. That's why this is important for, uh, for, for IT professionals to be using. It is one of the, de it's one of the defining characteristics for high performing IT organizations. And so I will hammer on, you should be using source control till I can't talk anymore. But, uh, <laughs> So, I, and I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to overstate this because this is an extremely important aspect. If you write PowerShell scripts that affect your production environments, you are a developer and are writing source code and it needs to be protected. And that means it needs to be put into version control. If you work with a team who shares scripts of any sort, whether, whether it's DSC, whether it's PowerShell, whether it's VB scripts, whatever, and you rely on those things that other people have written, that all needs to be in source control. If your onboarding process for new IT professionals does not include get them set up in your source control system, 
your onboarding processes need to be changed because that needs to be one of the definitive communication mechanisms for IT operations personnel. Yes? So what are you recommending for uh, source control? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Honestly, I don't care. Um, but you get it. Uh, so, so uh, I, when it, if you are using some sort of source control, I am not mad. Uh, I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm going to be very happy for you. Um, if your organization already uses something, like if you have developers in house and they're using something, and you can leverage their experience and you can leverage existing infrastructure, then go that route, unless there's a lot of it added licensing which you don't want to deal with. Um, but you should look, but you also learn Git. If you haven't, if you, if you haven't figured out by now, GitHub has kind of won the location, as the location for sharing of open source projects. And one of the, one of the interesting things is a lot of PowerShell projects are out there and even more, even more importantly, a lot of config management stuff lives out on GitHub. So if you're, uh, you know, if if you use one of the better config management tools like Chef, no, uh, <laughs> uh, just randomly picking something, uh, you're going to find a lot of stuff out on GitHub around that. Um, if you're using uh, if you're using desired state configuration, um, our friends over at the PowerShell team have a GitHub organization that has a bunch of PowerShell DSC resources that are out there and available. And they take pull requests from the public. Now, the only way for you to submit a pull request is if you know how to use Git. And uh, there'll be a, a session, um, is that Wednesday or today? Today. Uh, there's a session today about, uh, about uh, how the PowerShell team's working with the community. And they're going to go through a couple of specifics on things, but you know, GitHub is where all the cool projects are, and so you need to learn and be familiar with that. Whether or not you use, whether or not you have your own repositories on GitHub, I don't care. But you need to uh, you need to be familiar with and understand how to do it because that's where a ton of open source projects live. You need to be able to ha you need to have an account. Whether or not you have your own repositories, you need to have an account. It's free, but that's where you, that enables you to file issues against projects that are out there. You may or may not know this, but people who have open source projects, for the most part, love when you file issues. Because number one, it shows, hey, somebody's trying to use my stuff, and hey, they've hit a problem with it, maybe I can help make this better, or maybe I can get them around a problem. Or, and people share their source code because they want other people to use it. They want people to get value from it. And if there's things that are blocking you from doing that, issues. Now, how quickly people respond, everything else, that's going to vary. It's going to be across the board. It's going to be different across the board. But, but having an account, being able to interact there is extremely important for people in the IT space nowadays. Uh, and yes, there's, there's things like there's Bitbucket and CodePlex and things like that. Um, but when you look at where new projects are starting and where where the people where people are interacting a lot, it's GitHub. And I even look at the PowerShell team stuff. There's a GitHub organization out there. Where where's .NET open source? Is that on CodePlex? No, it's on GitHub. You know, um, just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Git is excellent for source code but not for binaries. Yes. Yep, and, and so there, there are, so, so stepping back into revision control, um, there, are other, there are other tools that you want to have for, for uh, controlling binaries or packaged products. Like uh, if you're uh, in Windows Management Framework 5, and we've been playing with uh, get module, install module, PowerShell get, if you're not, start playing with it because that will uh, revolutionize how you share modules around your enterprise. And WMF5, side-by-side -side versioning of modules. That's, that's a good thing. You get to you have the latest, but you, get to, you, can be specific, you can be specific about versions that you want. Um, that is awesome. Um, 
Yes. <clears throat> yes. That's that's my next point. So, um, yeah. So one of the uh, you know so what should we put in source control? I really should change this slide and change it to version control. But uh, one of the key things with repositories of any kind. If you are an enterprise, or if you are a shop that runs your own servers in your own data center or shared colo or something like that, or if you have deployments that have to succeed, you need to run your own versions of repositories. Who here uses WSUS? Okay, a lot of people. One of the reasons that you use WSUS is so you can control which patches go out to your servers, right? So in, rather than using the PowerShell gallery to control what versions of PowerShell modules are available, I'm going to run my own internal <laughs> NuGet server. The other reason that we run WSUS is so that if, for example, my internet is down or my machines are air-gapped or for whatever reason Windows Update is having issues, I am not blocked from updating my systems. Same type of thing. I don't want to be blocked on deploying new systems because chocolatey.org is down, or PowerShell Gallery is down, or Ruby Gems is down, or my Yum servers are down. If I'm deploying, uh, if I'm deploying some Red Hat stuff, for example. If you are doing it, if you are doing operations correctly, you have your own internal versions of these rep of these repositories. They might just be a caching pass through. Uh, tools like Artifactory. Can a lot, you can set up uh, in like a pass-through capacity where if it's not, say, say for example, you're getting a Ruby gem from rubygems.org. If, if it's not cached in your artifact or instance, you can configure that to go through to Ruby gems, grab it, bring it, and cache it internally. Um, so you can, you can, there's products out there that you can set up internal repositories. There's also open source projects where you can do it for free. There's a lot of flexibility as far as where you're going to put your artifacts. And by artifacts, I mean your, pa your NuGet packages for chocolatey uh, modules, or your uh, NuGet packages for PowerShell modules for PowerShell GET, or your, uh, uh, or your binaries for applications that you're deploying internally, or libra shared libraries that you're using. Any of that stuff, you need to have a some sort of internal repository, just like you have a WSUS server, to be able to control what goes out in your environments, as well as to isolate you from, from the internet, keeping you from being able to do stuff. Yes? How would you use that instead of a product like SCCM, for example, mm -hmm. for your distribution method? So SCCM is a distribution method. Uh, these are artifact repositories are really for uh, the storage location. Okay. So and, and they provide versioning and things like that. So uh, and fr from my personal perspective, SCCM in the data center belongs for operating system deployment and WSUS. And, and that's and that's and that's pretty much it. Um, on the desktop side of things, we can have a different discussion. Um, but I honestly don't manage desktops, and I, I almost never come from that perspective. Um, so, yes? Should specs be in source control as well? Yes, your specs should be with your source control. Yeah, and it wasn't on that slide. So it was just... uh, like specs like tests or specifications? Specifications. Ah, good point. Yes. Um, should really, I don't have a notebook with me. Um, I, will, I will make a note of Yeah, but when that yeah. doesn't happen, what you end up with all of your code without any architectural direction mm -hmm. to it. So, People who are coming into the code and don't know sort of what's the intent for this revision, yes. right? For this version of the module or whatever, um, can go to the spec. If there's no spec, if you put it on GitHub, for instance, and people are looking to see what your goals are, um, they can't tell. And, and so, um, and, and so, what the, the, that didn't jump out at me. You sh we should call that out. Um, one of the things that uh, that we see in. Oh, Okay, that's not actually tied together too well. Hang on. Check video. Check computer. 
That wasn't good. Um, <laughs> In business. Is the recording effective? Um, I let's see. Was the recording splitting off of it? The recording. Just to be sure. The recording. So we should be we should be okay. This video will be interesting to watch, uh, <laughs> listen to. You might want to fast forward through the last five minutes if you're watching this on, on the recording. Um, so uh, back to specifications. Um, one of the things I, I, I see a lot of is uh, writing the specifications in a testable framework. Um, some, and like on the Ruby side of things, you see it's like a, a cucumber where you can write your specifications and make them ex and then put some code behind them to make them executable. So you actually part of part of your testing process uh, actually runs the functional specifications uh, for for the software. Um, there are there are similar frameworks in the .NET space. I don't know if anyone doing anything like that in the PowerShell space at the moment. Um, Maybe yeah. It, right, it, and um, the so, so Pester is is still a more generic testing framework where something like Cucumber has um, has kind of some syntax and helper to be able to write those specifications uh, at, so that they look like specifications. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely see that. And so I my mental kind of default is well, they're with they're with the source code, <laughs> and so I did. That's a very good point, though, to call it. We should call them out specifically. Um, all right, so back to, all right. Any question as far as why we should use source control or why it's important for our team to use source control before we move on? Anyone here who adamantly thinks source control is a waste of time <laughs> and waste of effort and my dot back and dot old and my, you know, Folders by date is just fine. And yes. Uh, is it good to use a GitHub for an enterprise? It can be. Is it recommended or no? Well, um, so again, it, c it comes down to um, this is going to come down to, to use case and specifics. Uh, uh, so, like for example, my company uses GitHub exclusively for source control. Okay. Uh, so if GitHub is down we're going to 
to be in a little bit of hurt. Now, GitHub, is, so Git by itself is a distributed version control, which means that you don't really have a central server, but you can set up a, you can set one up to act as a central server, and it's just, it's just your pattern of behavior that makes GitHub the centralized server. So if GitHub goes down, whoever's got the most recent version of source control, because everyone's got a full copy of everything that's happened, we could very easily go to something else and, and, and move to something else. Um, so that, that's one of the nice things about it being a distributed version control system. Um, it, back when I ran infrastructure, I would want my own internal repository. And you could get something like GitLab, and it's very easy to set with Git. It's very easy to set up different remotes, so you could publish to an internal repository and then push up to GitHub if you're using Git internally, um, or you could push to Git and a Visual Studio Code for or you know, Visual Studio Online or something. Uh, you could do uh, you could do kind of a variety of things. A lot depends on your tolerance for risk, as far as what you if you want to depend on having some external service available. And there's also GitHub Enterprise, um, which is another option um, for doing Git, but inside the firewall. <coughs> and in terms of security? Uh, in ter so um, in terms of security, from most of what I interact with on GitHub, it publishes open source projects. And so it's open to view. There are some private repositories that we have. Um, and we have private repositories that contain code of things that we sell. So uh, we are, at least from the chef perspective, we're happy with that. Um, I personally can't speak to what the security posture of GitHub is, is um, but I would not put like SSH keys or secrets or anything like that in a GitHub, <coughs> in a, in a GitHub repository because it's extremely easy to make a private one public. Um, there, there's a checkbox and you gotta confirm it with your password. Um, so um, that type of stuff I would want to store some other, uh, I, I would not store secrets in a GitHub repository, but um, from, a, from a standpoint of would I put source, control, source code in a private repository on GitHub that I wanted to keep, you know, wanted to keep kind of uh, confidential, yeah. Maybe GitHub use um, GitLab in our environment because we can't have any external communication at all. Yep. So our Linux teams and Microsoft teams use it completely internally without any use of GitHub at all. Yep, yeah, G GitLab, uh, that's what we were using, at, that's what we migrated to at Stack Exchange. So when I was working at Stack Exchange, we initially started using Killen, um, which was a hosted, which had hosted Mercurial. Um, and then we, then, then Git one, <laughs> as far as the version control. So, so Mercurial is another distributed version control system that was similar, more similar to Subversion. Um, but we moved, we moved, we decided, um, all the, all the different uh, technical groups decided we're gonna move to Git. And so we, we looked at GitHub, we looked at doing GitHub Enterprise, and then we decided on going with GitLab. Um, and GitLab has a open source version and they have a, they have a, a paid, they have paid support as well. Um, but yeah, Git, GitLab gives you a lot of the same benefits as GitHub, but inside the firewall. Don't forget about uh, VSO. Yep. Visual Studio Online. It supports Git as well. Yep. Visual Studio Online does does Git, and so you, if you know if you're looking at for as far, as far as online repositories, that's another option for you as well. And we use that for private and, and GitHub for public. So, and so, but when you're determining whether or not you're going to use some online service, it comes down to kind of how your environment is structured. Like at, at Chef, for example, we're a primarily distributed workforce. So whether or not we hosted our own internal service or external service, we're still reliant on the internet heavily. And GitHub has a good enough reliability that we're confident that that's, and, and it's, and also that's where the community goes for things. So it's easiest, it's easiest for us as an open source company to have our stuff on GitHub uh, versus running our own thing. From an enterprise perspective, like when I was at, or from a, uh, you know, a private company perspective, when I was at Stack Exchange, 
we wanted to have that internal instance that we managed. And we could push other stuff to GitHub, but we'd we'd, it would just be one of the other remotes. It wouldn't be our primary location to, de to deploy from. All right, any other questions or commentary around source control? Well, one thing perhaps is that this is a bit of a journey. It could take a bit of time before you, especially if you go through kind of every, every department, you know, storage, networking, whatever. Uh, so one of the things to consider is doing automatic check-ins on, on configurations and things that aren't really there yet. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have firewalls, you can usually retrieve the configuration and then check it in automatically to get, and then you will at least have some change control, even though it's perhaps not the preferred way to do it before they change the code, but at least you know the difference whenever <coughs> something goes wrong. Uh, e excellent, excellent point. Um, you know, for, the, for the processes where you don't have source control in place, um, grabbing those config files, get, having a process that will go through periodically and check them in, is, you know, make, making sure there hasn't been changes, or that those changes are, are version and track. And also, this, is, this stuff is a journey. It, you, you don't just come in one day and say, okay, we're gonna do all the, all the DevOps all the time, everybody switch, and you know, cha change, your, <coughs> change your patterns of behavior. It, it's a ch it's change over time, and tooling can help drive the culture change that you need to to kind of achieve that kind of DevOps transformation. But tooling alone doesn't do it. There has to be that this willingness to kind of collaborate and work together. But tooling can help, and so start, you know, when you st you start using source control yourself, then you start kind of infecting your teammates and getting everybody involved, and then other t and then you start you know. It, and again, it depends how much organizational power you have. You know, if you're an individual contributor, you might have the ability to influence your coworkers. If you have, if you're a team lead, you might be able to dictate to your team and say, "Okay, we're using source control." If you're a manager, you might say, "Hey, my whole team, we're going to use this." But whatever your level of organizational influence, you want you want to encourage this practice. And you start realizing more and more benefits the more people start taking advantage of it. And yeah, it, uh, so yes, totally. That was an excellent, excellent point there. All right. Uh, last call, source control commentary, and we're moving on. All right, moving on. Continuous delivery. Who here's heard that term? Who here's heard? Continuous deployment, are they the same thing? Hands up for yes. Don't, or, or don't know. <laughs> Perfect, all right. So whenever we hear DevOps, we, all, we, we very often hear in conjunction with that, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And there are two completely different concepts. Well, I shouldn't say completely different. They're, they're somewhat related, but Continuous deployment. Pardon? Both are kind of continuous. They, they are, yeah, they both they share they they share the word they share the word continuous and they both start with D. Um, and so continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Continuous deployment is any any change I make and check into source control. See, source control kind of we build on top here. Um, so source control any change I check into source control ends up in production without any user intervention. That is what most people think of when they hear continuous delivery, but that is actually continuous deployment. And that is one option in what some, in what some environments do. Continuous delivery is really what we should be striving for. And continuous delivery means that from our and this, so going back to the source control concept, of, from our master branch, from our central <laughs> repository, whatever the primary branch is, that should always be in a releasable or usable state. That means there shouldn't be broken tests. That means if I push whatever's in master into production, it'll work. That means whatever's there should be working. And so when I merge changes in, those changes should be shippable. But whether or not you actually ship that code, or ship that version, or ship those configurations, 
is a decision to be made by IT or the business or development. It just means that we are always able, we always have a working version in trunk or in master. And so we want to strive to have continuous delivery for all of our infrastructure projects, for all of our applications, and especially appropriate in light of this morning, continuous delivery of coffee. You were not experiencing that this morning. Uh, <laughs> so. That should be deployment, right? It should flow automatically. It should. <laughs> but continuous delivery does not exclude continuous deployment. It, but you need continuous delivery to do continuous deployment right. So, now the first rule of Automation Club is that we don't want any magic people or machines. What that means is we do not build things on our workstations and push them into production. Um, if we are building configs, on, like say, let's, let's shift into DSC mindset for a second. If we're building DSC configurations on our workstation and we're pushing those into production, you are doing it wrong. I did not say very many things that, very, that definitively, Yes, that one is one I will say you are doing it wrong. And that's one of the, uh, uh, we had DSC camp a few, uh, a few weeks ago. And, um, and it got tweeted a bit that that was kind of the thing I, I said a lot. There's only one or two things I actually say that about. And this, and this particular thing is something I am very, very, uh, I, I'm very, very, uh, supportive of and I, I feel very strongly about source control is one of them and now this and the, the second part is this build process is uh, is that we want to have a consistent standardized way of getting our changes into production and that means we can't block on hey is Steven is Steven at work today so that we can deploy changes Anybody on my team needs to be able to make changes and get them out into production. If my workstation is down because my hard drive failed, that should not stop my coworkers from deploying into production. So we don't want any magic people or machines. We want to be able to rebuild whatever machine can create those configurations or build that software or send those things out into production. We want to be able, we should be able to repeatedly build those things and, and my, and that my coworkers should be able to replicate that. So what, I, what that process comes down to is what I often refer to as a build. Um, I steal a lot of stuff from the software development and so, uh, software development space because I've been working primarily in DSC and now, and now Chef in configuration management. And guess what? That, that space is known as infrastructure as code. That means if you run infrastructure, you're a developer because you're developing your infrastructure as code. If you don't accept that label and you're writing scripts to manage your infrastructure, you're writing code because it, that code tells systems what to do. You're a developer, get over it. <laughs> but we need a build process. That build process needs to start with information from our source control. That means not information coming from your workstation, not information pulled from some uh, ephemeral share somewhere, you want a revision that you're going to pull out of your version control system to start your build process. Or if you go in, if you're if we're talking more generically about revision control or version control, if I'm if I need to pull artifacts, it's pulling them from my artifact repository, not from not from some random location. We want to pull from centralized sources that we know are the known good, so, known state of good. It needs to run automated tests because if I have to, <coughs> if, if I have to manually test changes, I I don't get this. I don't get this. Uh, I don't get this flow. See, there, there's nobody standing in the middle here. You know, we want to have this flow of business idea to business value. And so we need to have our tests automated. 
We'll dig into those in just a minute. And we need to be able to deploy to the desired environment. Not everything goes to production right away. Some of us may have staging or acceptance or user acceptance or development environments that things need to go to first. Or they might have workflows or checkoffs that they need to uh, go through. So just because we're talking about this automated process does not mean you cannot put the controls in place that you need to. Yes, automated test, yes. Yeah. One question about <coughs> automated test, are you referring to like test by test for, for PowerShell? And if so, I, I, there's one thing that I, that I really have a hard time with, and tests come from real software development, and in PowerShell scripts you often have things that change your environment and that are really hard to test. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to test it, you have to do it. And I don't want to create a share or delete a user just to test that test. Great, great question, and we're getting right to that. So there's a, uh, so if we could just put a pin in that one, we'll be there in just a second. So there's a couple different types of tests that we can automate. First one's linting, and that's is our syntax correct? Are we are we hitting any <coughs> major problems uh, or common problems of things that uh, that we might have in the language? We're not actually testing behavior or anything. We're actually just looking at the code as it stands and running some, running some rules against it. In the PowerShell space, we now have PS Script Analyzer to help with that. In the, um, in the Ruby world, we have RuboCop. In, chef, in the Chef space, we have Food Critic. Um, and, and, and so you have these, these linting tools that can help you make sure that the, the code's following to hit. In C-sharp development, you have things like uh, FX cop and uh, style cop. And so you have these tools out there that can help maintain you know, correctness of style, um, structure, look, look out for common problems. <coughs> then we have unit testing. And unit testing is something that's intended to be done uh, on a very uh, fast basis to run continuously as you're doing things. Um, so as you make changes, you can run your unit tests to make sure that things don't break. Um, and tools like Pester come in handy for this. Um, on, on, the, uh, on the Ruby side of things, we use uh, RSpec or uh, Minitest, which uh, is included with Ruby. Uh, you'll see uh, MS, uh, Microsoft has a test framework in Visual Studio for C Sharp and uh, NAL.NET development. Um, and there's other, there's X, there's uh, NUnit, and there's different, there's all sorts of different unit test frameworks out there. And they all have different, little different syntax, little different structure. Um, find one that works for you. On the PowerShell side of things, the communities kind of come together around Pester, and that's going to start, that's starting with, uh, with Win 10. It's starting to ship inbox with Windows. So, um, the Microsoft folks have come on board with the idea that, hey, this testing thing's important, especially important to ship and share, because the PowerShell team has been testing for ages and ever. They just haven't been sharing those tests with us because they've been using internal frameworks. Now they've come on board and they're actually participating in a working group along with the Pester project to help improve Pester going forward and they're starting to ship Pester in the box. We have functional tests, and this goes back to some of that, the spec testing that, uh, that we talked about a little earlier, like, does it behave as we expect it to? And this is uh, this functional and this next <coughs> category of integration or acceptance tests, these come back to a lot of those tests that may, may change the state of our systems. And because in the, in the case of PowerShell, we're often talking about commands that change the state of infrastructure adding users, changing service states, uh, deploying files or shares, things like that. <coughs> now, we can use Pester to test those things. Um, in the unit side of things, we're gonna, use, we're gonna use one of the capabilities of Pester to mock commands to mock out the things that can change system state. We don't want, unit tests should not change the state of your system. So if I, for example, in the Stack Exchange resources on GitHub, uh, I have a page file resource. Every time I run my unit tests, I don't want my page file changing on my system and telling my system it needs to reboot to change the page file. I want 
to be, and I, and I don't want my tests to flip it back and forth between automatically managed and setting a size. And so I mock out the function, the part, and I, may, I verify my logic. Do I have to change the state of the system up to actually changing the state? And then I use a command that's safe to, va to validate, hey, it got the right parameters. Then I get to my integration testing or my functional testing or acceptance testing. In that case, I'm going to use a tool and like you, uh, if you come to my session tomorrow, you'll see it in much more depth. But I use a tool like Test Kitchen to, to glue together things like machine provisioning, configuration application, and a test run. And so I can spin up an isolated environment, apply or run, my, or, or run the configuration or run the script or whatever's going to have a side effect, and then make some assertions against that system to see if it did what I expect it to do. And so in the case of things where we're gonna have that side of system, those side effects, where we need to test that, that to me falls more into the functional or, or integration and acceptance testing uh, side of things. And so for my unit tests, I wouldn't be creating a new user, I'd be validating that the correct function got called to create the user, not actually creating the user. Does that kind of answer? the same standards of testing to the PowerShell script code. It, it, sometimes it's just not possible to do the unit testing things because the interesting things that we break are those that change the system state and that's the things that I include. So, uh, so I'd say yeah, th you're not going to cover that in your integration test or your unit test but you will cover that in your integration tests. Right, okay. and, and, and for me those are the most, those are some of the most important tests when I'm talking about code that's going to change the state of my system especially in the context of config management. Because in config management, I'm talking about I have an agent out on a box somewhere that's gonna be running code in the background that can change the state of my systems. And that scares the living crap out of me unless I've got a high degree of confidence that the code's gonna do what I expect it to do. And I can only gain that level of, of, of confidence if I have my integration tests that show me, given this state, this is what it does. Given state B, this is what it does. And so while I might not ever be fully happy with the level of testing I have in any one particular thing, a combination of linting, unit, functional, and integration tests can raise my level of confidence in the code that I'm deploying. Sure. And one of, one of the key things to remember here is, and going back, going back, I'm sorry, uh, what was your name again? Uh, Christopher. Christopher. Uh, Christopher. Uh, his, uh, Christopher's point earlier, this is a journey. This is not a flip a switch and I've got all my test coverage in place and I'm happy with it. It's, I'm starting, I'm going to start linting my code. I'm going to start adding a couple of integration tests to make sure it does the right thing. I'm going to add a couple of unit tests. I'm going to start breaking up my functions so they're easier to test. It, it, it's a it's a progression and a journey. Not you know now we're we're going to start tomorrow writing all the tests for everything. Um, yes. So did the Chef Kitchen actually set up? Is it a framework for setting up the environment and also a framework for doing the integration testing? Or? Yes. So so what what Test Kitchen will do is uh, it's it's got a plugin model and some and some uh, one, so one of the plugins will spin up a machine and that could for example be. Uh, Hyper-V, it could use Vagrant, it could use AWS, it could use uh, whatever, uh, and it will spin up, a it can spin up a machine. Then the second part of the, the test run uh, is called the provisioner, and that's either gonna run a shell script, it's gonna run Chef, it's gonna run DSC, uh, to, to get the machine into a certain state. And then the last phase is the test run, or the, uh, the verifier, that in, uh, in my use case, I'll run Pester, you can also run server spec or R spec or some other test framework. But it'll run pester tests to validate that it did what I expect it to do. And so, in each of the cases, I'm writing the configuration, I'm writing the, I'm writing the pester test, and Test Kitchen just gives me a way to glue all of those things together. So I can spin up, I can say kitchen test. It'll spin up, it'll spin up a node, apply the configuration, run the test. If everything succeeds, destroy the VM, and then I'm ready to go. Um, or I can do it, I can kind of interactively <coughs> do the steps, like I can say kitchen converge and it'll apply the configuration, I can make a change to it, apply the configuration, 
do things like that. And, and uh, I have a full session on that tomorrow. So the risk with that is your your cycle just gets much longer because then integration has to spin up a new environment. So if you're changing and if you're doing, let's say you build a new DC, you, you change the way you build the new DC, you have integration tests trying to do that in your test environment, then spin, spinning up the whole environment, test environment can take a long time. Yep, and, and so these, these kind of go in a progressive amount of time that they take to run, so, right? So linting can go real fast, it's just looking at the, it's just looking at the code on disk. Unit tests can also be very quick, but they're, exer they're actually exercising and executing code, so they might take a little bit longer. But ideally, your unit tests for a particular bit of, of code, and that can be script, whatever, should go very, very quickly. It should be seconds, so that it's not blocking your workflow. Uh, one of the things that I'll do when I'm when I'm developing is I actually have my editor open in, on one side and I have a, a PowerShell window down the side and I'm running a file system watcher. I'm using a, a, a project called PowerShell Guard, um, which you can install with uh, install module. <laughs> but um, it has a, it sets up a file system watcher on the project and it'll run the tests every time that there's a, a the file changes on disk. So I'll edit, save, tests run. Edit, save, tests run. Edit, save, and I'm not manually running anything, it's just running them in the background for me uh, as things change. And I make sure that, you know, as I add tests, those get added and run. As I change, my test coverage keeps, keeps going, so I see if I break things. Um, the functional tests can take a little longer because now we, we wanna make sure we're in an isolated environment because they, can, they could change the state of the system. And then same with integration and acceptance because I'm, I'm going to have, there's a little more pain around setting up those, or a little more time around setting up those environments. One of the things you can do with Kitchen is once you spin up that VM, you can still apply, a, you, can, you can apply a config, change things, apply it over, and, and you can achieve a little more of that REPL type environment that you know kind of re-evaluate print loop. Um, it's not, but then you still want to go through and do a clean test through. Um, so, it, but I would rather spend the time on that than debugging it in production. Because when I'm developing my tests outside of a production capacity, and I'm doing them just you know as part of my work to get something done, I'm not under the pressure of everyone calling, this environment's down got to get it back up what's wrong and, and, ha and spending more time you know getting on to conference calls about why things are down than actually fixing why they're down uh, because you have you have a lot more latitude to, to get that testing done outside of that context uh, so. Question? yes um, let's say we're wanting to start this kind of tests um, is there any trick or tip on how to get a testing environment out of a, of a running system, running environment. So let's say um, you got some server 2008R2 with running applications on it and you want to test against them. Is it just spinning up uh, a snapshot VM or? Yeah, or just VHD. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's some, yeah it's just grabbing an image of that, uh, uh, grabbing a running image of that. Now, if you, it, as you get, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, con, in the config management space, and if you, in case you haven't been able to tell. Um, but once you have a model of your systems, then it becomes much easier to spin up test environments. But if you don't have that in place, um, using like a P2V type tool or, or grabbing a snapshot if it's already a VM uh, or a cloud instance somewhere, and then spinning up another version of that in an isolated network. And that, that that can give you uh, that can give you uh, an environment in which to do your integration testing. Um, okay. So then we talked about deployment, and I mentioned that it doesn't have we deployment doesn't actually have to always go through to production. It could go to a test environment. It could just be in my integration testing environment. Right. One of the key things to know now that you are you're all developers um, is that 
there are a lot of products out there that do workflows and approvals processes and stuff like that. And you can glue in whatever you need to there to make your build pipeline include that stuff. So if you need to get sign-offs before things can go through different environments, you can do, you can do that. But the mo but usually, usually there's not gonna be an off-the-shelf process or an off-the-shelf product that will model your internal approvals process out of the box. So you're gonna need to do you're gonna need to do some work to do that, but you have the flexibility in the tooling that's out there nowadays to glue together what you need to do. So if you need to put some PowerShell workflows in place, or you need to glue in something from SMA or uh, or uh, a SharePoint workflow or whatever you need to do. But since you're developers, the, the onus is back on you to be able to do this now, to, to go out and figure out how, how do we make this stuff happen. And it could be as simple as the very first step in creating our build pipeline is I want to set up a server that can generate my configs and deploy it to one node in a, in a dev environment or a test environment. And that is my build pipeline. And the only, the only people, person that has to approve <coughs> that going is me committing to source control to get into that dev environment. And we can add the complexity later. But you need to start at a place where you can build that environment. But then you say, well, but what about maintenance windows? We got those things too, right? Again, you're developers. You can control when this stuff happens. There are things like scheduled jobs and things that we can do on, on, on a particular timeline. Just because we push something to our source control that kicks off a build that deploys an artifact doesn't mean your client nodes have to go grab it right away. Or that's the whole thing about these versions, and version constraints. We can, we can put version constraints in place and say, everything in this environment is locked to this version. I can push new stuff all day long, but as long as that version constraint is still in place, on my configurations, they're only going to get that version that's the, that latest version or the version that they're locked to. So we can deal with maintenance windows. There are things that we can work around. There's not there's nothing, for example, in the DSC LCM about it. It doesn't have to be. We can we can we can work with it. We can work with that. The other the other thing about this is who here has to deal with maintenance windows? Pretty much everybody. So, if something goes wrong, and it's during it's not during a maintenance window. If you have a if you deployed some software into production and during a maintenance window, and things go live and there's a problem, and they need to deploy a fix, are, do you have like emergency patching procedures or emergency fix procedures that happen outside of that maintenance window? On call. Hmm. On call. Yeah, but I mean. It, do changes ever get pushed into that production environment outside of those maintenance windows? And if you had a serious enough bug, yes. Well, one of the things about building this pipeline to get those changes out into production is we have a consistent way to get those changes out regardless of context. So if it's a maintenance window and I need to get a change in there because there's an emergency, if I have a build pipeline that consistently can deploy those changes into production, now my, pat, my emergency patch procedure is a lot less risky because I have a standard way it's gonna happen every single time. It's not, again, we're, deal, we're, on, this, we're on this war room conference call and people are screaming about things. It's, all right, they've checked in the fix, deploy. All right, let, let me know if it works and you can go back to your daily job. Um, sir, I, I, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek, a little facetious about, but honestly, if, if you have that, if you built up that capability to deploy changes on demand, if you have that continuous delivery mindset, and you can always take whatever that change is going to be and get it into production, you greatly eliminated a lot of headaches, hassles, and um, you know, so, some of the things around this emergency patching that you might need to do. Doesn't mean it's never gonna happen, but when it does happen, you'll have a consistent way to do that. Um, I've only got five more minutes, so I'm going to jump, fortunately we don't have too much more to get through. Um,
But the second way of DevOps is to amplify the feedback loop. So we've talked a good bit, and that some of the most important parts are that first wave of getting that stuff from business idea to business value. But how do we know it's value? Well, that's where we add this feedback loop. And how, what delivers that feedback loop? What tells us that things are working? Part of that is logging. How do we know things are working? Well, we have our event logs, we have application logs, stuff like that. But if all that stuff just lives out on the nodes where things are, are happening, we have to interactively go to those boxes to get that stuff. You need to have some sort of centralized event logging. You need to be able to bring those logs back somewhere, even if you're not doing anything with them yet. But you need to have a central place that you go to look for logs, or to go for, look for logs. Whether you use event log forwarding, or Splunk, or log stats with Elasticsearch, or something like that. You don't want the log information you're looking for to be out in some node somewhere. And the reason that you don't want that oh, uh, is really because as you move to a more DevOps mindset where you don't care about individual servers as much, those server instances may or may not be there when you go looking. You might have had, if you are having a problem in production, you might spin up a whole new environment and shift production load to it, and those other instances might be gone. So you want to have those, you want to have those logs in place. Um, when I was at Stack Exchange, for example, if we were having problems on one web server but not the other eight, blow that operating system away, deploy new, it's back into production. And I'm going back to our central event log repository later if I care about trying to figure out what was going on in that node or, that cent or the centralized event log, uh, centralized error logging uh, location for all the apps. All the apps in the Stack Exchange environment reported error logs back to a central location so we could see and get alerted from one place uh, on when things were happening wrong. We can see, is it happening on one node? Is it happening across the board? Are a lot of nodes experiencing this? And so we can tell if it's a systemic pro problem or if it's isolated to a particular node. So, so you wanna have the centralized event logging, centralized logging of, of any kind. And then you wanna have service monitoring. Yes? Do you use parental powerful scripts with the event logging? Not so much, because most of what I write now is is uh, uh, config management, and I will I will instrument those with like verbose messages and stuff like that, and I'll get stumped to the logs. So I'm not specifically calling out event logging, but but I am putting in log messages that do get logged to an event stream somewhere, whether it's the chef client log or whether it's a DSC log. Um, so I got two minutes. <laughs> All right, but. Simple machine up down, that kind of monitoring as you move to a more cloud, whether it's internal or external environment, doesn't matter anymore because machine instances become much more ephemeral. They, they, they're not as important anymore. So we need to know what it takes for a service to be healthy. <coughs> that means you need to talk to the application developers to know what that means and, and come up with stuff together. And then if you have a build, if you have a if you have a process for getting changes into production, that one of those things that you need to be able to change is your monitoring. So you can take monitoring changes from your development into production. So you need to practice that first way with your monitoring technology as well. So if your monitoring technology doesn't support that, maybe it's time to look at new stuff. All right. Um, third way: tighten up those timelines. And I got ten seconds. I have a DevOps reading list that I published on my blog. And um, this deck will be out there as well. But uh, stephenmorowski.com, DevOps reading list. I've got a couple of books outlined. I'm going to be adding to this as we go. But these, this is some further reading that you can enjoy. And with that, I'm 13 seconds over. And I'm going to push the button. <laughs>